Welcome to chapter 4. Let's answer the core activity B of your CMOS SCS exam. So it follows the business ecosystem and the business environment for the Safewell company. Now, as always, CIMA has set the following ICANN questions that you must answer. So let's dip into each of these, okay, from the next slide onwards. Now, firstly, in your CIMA SCS syllabus in the past, that we have got the ecosystem. I'm sure that you've covered that in your objective test uh, studies before. Now, of course, according to the ecosystem model, there have been four types there. The most applicable type for the uh, safe whale company would be the lion's pride. Because the industry itself is relatively complicated. So, for example, lots of competition at the same time, high barriers to entry. And of course, we have got a variety of clients, technology partners, dealing with lots of regulatory entities and working with lots of security professionals. I would say that this industry is rather complicated. So at the same time, we are as a leader in this industry. So this means that in terms of orchestration, it would be quite tight rather than being quite loose. Now, the idea behind the orchestration is that we need to be a leader in setting up the common standard so for other stakeholders to follow. So that's why for the implications for a safe road company is that we need to continue to set standards and rules within this industry. Possibly, we may be lobbying the government or other organisations as well, in particular for the cyber security practices or the data protection. We need to be a leader in all sorts of, especially these areas as well. Now, the actions I would recommend to adopt, for example, we may need to establish and to enforce industry standards. So, I am the boss, in other words. We need to monitor the ecosystem health properly, particularly for any particular participant who are not following the standard. So we need to take it out okay, from this market, for example. Using a leadership position and to guide the industry towards emerging security challenges and to coming up with solutions. So this is why I see Lion's Pride we are not simply making a profit any longer, but our focus will be a leader in these areas so we can be more sustainable in terms of our growth into the future. The next area is according to Michael Porter's generic strategies. There will be actually three types of strategies. For example, lowering down your costs, being a cost leadership. Alternatively, to differentiate yourself from others. And I would say that in this company, it's the Safewell company, so our revenue is very, very high there uh, across the top 10 uh, competitors. I would say in, in this market, it's more like in the oligopoly market. So this means that instead of simply reducing your cost to a certain extent and to charge a lower price, but I would prefer differentiation to be used in this industry. However, rather than focusing on a niche market, I would say that focusing on the general market is more common with differentiation. Now, to differentiate yourself in terms of your operation, how you're going to be dealing with your client, in terms of making sure that it tailors the customer's needs, or perhaps you're going to be innovate your services that you can provide to your client. So it's entirely up to you. So this is the uh, direction that you may be focusing on here. According to the of Growth Vector Matrix, it says, based on the X as well as the Y axis, based on the new product or the existing product or the existing market, which means the client, for example, I would say the main focus for the Safeway company, perhaps is on the market development. 
So it means that we may be needing to develop a market, so in other words, to increase the client's base. Okay, so we can sell our services to a range of other clients to expand the market, technically, market share. Now, a very common and easy question that you can think about that is that what causes the environment to change? I would say that yes, technology or the demand from clients, globalization, emerging economy, so we are going to be competing with uh, those companies in other countries. Geopolitics, changing demographics, customer empowerment, automation sustainability, and this is why we have got different opportunities that we can think up, think of when we are managing the safe whale company okay, in the future. I've also done the petzl analysis to analyse the macro environment that the safe whale company is operating in. From the political point of view, we need to keep an eye on the tax and tariffs if we are dealing with the global client. Political stability and the government support whether or not we can get a subsidy, for example. From the economic size point of view, yes, I've done the summary from the current status and also looking at the future, so what sort of areas they need to focus on. I'm sure that you can read them on your own. I'm sure that you're quite familiar with the PETSO analysis to use the PESTEL, these letters, to analyse the macro environments that you're operating in. I've also done the Porter's value chain to analyse the internal perspective of the safe whale company from the primary as well as from the support activities point of view. So for example, how are going to be storing data, which means the inbound logistics, how are going to process it, which means the operations, how are going to be turned that into the output, for example, the report or the services that we can provide, which means the outbound logistics. And then, how are we going to be marketing and sales of our services and after-sales services that we provide. So these five are the primary activities. On the other hand, we are spending money out, which means the procurement. We're going to be focusing on the R&D, research and development, which means an other element of the supporting activities, which is the technology development. And the HR, as well as the firm infrastructure, talking about where does the money come from, and also how we're going to be setting up our reporting lines in our company. Now, with a bit of application, especially for the area to improve, for example, I would highly recommend the Safeway company to improve this expenditure on the R&D. Perhaps you maybe collaborate with a tech company, especially for startup companies with the AI function in there. Establishing a dedicated innovation hub to make sure that you keep an eye on to the latest changes of the technologies. And also, perhaps you may be thinking about the strategic acquisitions and to make sure that you can process unique technologies inside your business. Foster the culture of innovation, it will be very important to meet with the value of the safe world company. We are talking about it from the firm infrastructure's point of view. Now, of course, using a data analysis as well, yes, we can gain insight from the vast amount of data that we can collect. And therefore, it will certainly help building our infrastructure and helping with all other activities inside business. Now, I'm not saying that you need to learn or to memorize all this point, because all I've done for you is to further familiarize yourself with the company, which means the safe whale, by applying this to the syllabus knowledge. Okay, so you can uh, easily recap on what is going on when you see the future exam questions. I've also done the Porter's Five Forces analysis for you. We are actually analysing the micro environment the Safe World Company is operating in. So, for example, talking about the new competitors and the suppliers and the client and the substitute and the existing competitors. I would say that I've done the um, 
conclusion for you, it would be a high barriers to entry because this industry is very, very complicated. You need professional guys. At the same time, you need someone who really has the knowledge and also knowing the legislation. With regards to suppliers, I would say that it's okay high, which means moderate to high, because in terms of supplier, we are talking about the staff, we are talking about money, we are talking about the materials. In terms of materials, so for example, the protective equipment that we buy from our suppliers would be okay, but in terms of staff, I would say the power would be quite high there. And even for the buyer, yes, uh, their power, moderate, okay, um, substitutes, relatively low, but competitors, I would say that rivalry, competition, would be quite high. It's like in an oligopoly market. So we can't simply lower uh, our prices, charge, for example. I've also done the poorest diamond for you. So this means that if you further operate your business, focusing on the overseas market, so what sort of factors do you need to consider? So for example, you need to consider the factor condition where or not you've got the skilled staff and also infrastructure related to technology. You need to consider demand from a client. So for example, where or not they are willing to buy your services, for example, and where or not the client space would be quite diverse and sophisticated. If the answer for that is yes, they've got different demands, and perhaps you need to provide very tailored solutions to them. And also you need to consider the related and supporting industries and to see whether or not you've got a strong supply chain and whether or not you should foster a very strong partnership relationship with the colleges and universities to make sure that you've got enough uh, skilled workers from these universities such as the, gra uh, the graduate. And also you need to think about the firm strategy in the countries that you're operating uh, in, that you're competing with. So I would say that, for example, in some of the countries, if you're operating in that country, they will focus on keeping the prices quite low in order to force you out from the market. So you need to watch out, okay, to manage these risks properly. Government support and whether or not you've got any chances that you can be quite flexible to embrace the opportunity. So these are the factors that you need to consider when you're operating overseas. Now, the exam question I would say in the SCS exam will be relatively open. So this means that there will be nearly no correct answers at all. So make sure that when you are facing a question, okay, what do you think of the ecosystems that we are operating in? What do you think of the uh, overseas market? So what sort of factors that you need to consider? So make sure that you get some ideas from these models by simply integrating these models all together and this will be absolutely fine there. Now, in terms of the stakeholders analysis, applicable to the Safewell company, I've used the Mendeloes mapping matrix and to classify and to identify different stakeholders that you need to care about. Of course, based on the Mendeloes mapping matrix, according to two axes, based on the interest as well as the power, it can either be high or low. So interest, which means just to be the stake of the stakeholders, power, where or not they can impact or influence our company. So the power can, have, can either be high or low in there. Now, I would say that key players in this industry with things like our... Uh, I mean, the large clients and also the governmental uh, entities. Uh, so there will, there will certainly be a key player. So our solution in detail is that feedback mechanism, customization of services and proactive communication with them will be very important. There. So bear these in mind when you are asked on the exam day that how you're going to be managing the stakeholders in this industry. So you need to be quite specific. First is to classify them and then providing the detailed solution of that. And also the regulatory bodies, very important. Open lines of communication will be absolutely important there. So for example, having a workshop, 
So invite members from the regulatory bodies to attend and so uh, having very proactive communication would be very important there. And of course you can see, for example, another category to keep satisfied these stakeholders like suppliers and partners, um, to keep informed like employees and local communities, a minimum effort, general public. So uh, these are sort of ideas that you can uh, think about on the exam day. I've also done the balance scorecard for you specifically for the Safewell company from the financial as well as non-financial point of view. Uh, make sure they're absolutely happy with these KPIs and so on, including the internal operations, for example, the efficiencies and so on. But another area in your syllabus is the performance pyramid. Now, what performance pyramid actually does will be very similar to the balance scorecard. So, however, we are seeing things from a different perspective. We are saying that we need to have a very clear corporate vision to guide us through where would be our final destination. And the success of that will be based on the success that we managed our market as well as the financial part quite smoothly. In order to build up your market share, you need to make sure your client's happy. You need to make sure that you're quite flexible in meeting with your client's needs. You need to be quite productive. So you can be quite efficient by utilizing the limited amount of your capital and turn that into profit as well as the sales revenue. Which means, yes, this will impact on the market and this will also impact on the financial success. So, of course, the customer satisfaction will be really depending on whether or not your service quality will be quite high, whether or not you deliver that on time. Deliver that on time, it will also impact on the flexibility and also the cycle time. Cycle time, which means the time that it takes to introduce the service to the market. The cycle time will also impact on the productivity and the waste would be another factor that we need to consider whether or not you are productive. And of course, these would be from different levels. For example, the business units level, we are talking about the market as well as the financial. The operating system, we are talking about these three. And different departments and centers, we are talking about these four. And of course, for left-hand side, it's more like the external focus. On the right-hand side, it's more like the internal focus. It means that we need to work our way through from top to bottom, starting with the objective and then detailed planning actions. And of course, the detailed planning actions will be like the measures in place because the foundation is quite strong so we can arrive at the core provision at some point in the future. And of course, for each of those, as you can say, I've done different analysis for you of sort of KPIs that you can use and you can see this specific case applicable to the Safeway company on your bone there. It's very important uh, that from the strategic point of view, we need to perform the benchmarking exercises. Now, what we can do in terms of benchmarking, we can perform the internal benchmarking, let's say the employee training programs among different subsidiaries within our group. Alternatively, the process benchmarking, so for example, how we actually support our client. So we can benchmark up and find the best, okay, and then we need to copy that, for example. Alternatively, to benchmark against one of the competitors, just to copy that, for example. Now, the syllabus also introduces the EVA as well as the SVA uh, stuff. Now, what EVA actually does is that if the EVA is positive, it is doing a good job, particularly for the investment centre. So all we can say is that we take the net operating profit after tax, and then we're going to be minusing the capital employed times by the cost of capital. So this means that if any profit exceeding the cost of finance, this means that operating in this business or the new project will be quite good, will be financially viable. 
On the flip side, the SBA, the shareholder value added, we simply take the ROI, which means the return on investment, and to minus like the interest expense, okay, exceeding the interest cost, we simply times by the capital employed or the investments that we made, and to see how much value would be attributed to shareholders. And of course, if the figure is positive, yes, we are doing a good job. We also have got a very simple idea about the triple bottom line. Of course, nowadays, the triple bottom line, yes, we call this like the ESG stop. Now, the triple bottom line, I've used my own mnemonic for this. It's called PPP. Firstly, we care about people, which means the social responsibility. And of course, in our case, we treat our employee on a fair basis. We need to care about the planet which means to make sure from the environmental's point of view is sustainable. And also we keep an eye on the profit, which means we need to be innovative to expand our market and so on. So you can read them on your own. I even prepared the integrated report for you related to the Safeway company. So in other words, the integrated report will show how capital We grow. The integrated report will have certain capitals in terms of money, which means the financial capital, manufactured capital like raw materials, intellectual property capital like brand, human capital like our staff, social relationship capital like the relationship with the government authorities and also regulatory bodies, and also the natural capital, so for example the land and buildings that we are using. So we are showing these as the input into the process and then facing with risks and opportunities from the outside and the performance of our business and also our strategy, which means the outlook. And then based on the outlook, vision and mission, we set to our detailed strategy within using our business models with our business activities like the pauses value chain. And then we turn this input into such processes and then we can arrive at the output with the desired outcome of how this capital, each of them, will grow and so on. So what I've done for you is that for each of them, for example, the organisational overview and the governance structure, the business model, risks and opportunities, strategy, resource allocation, performance and then how we report these, I've linked with the Safeware company so you can read them on your own. And of course, it's important that in this paper, you always need to think about how to manage risks properly, not just for a client, but also for yourself. So for example, we may be facing political risk, especially as we enter into a foreign joint venture agreement we need to ensure that we understand there might be regulatory changes and also caring about the stability of the political stuff in the overseas country. And also, we may be thinking about to obtain agreement or contract with a foreign government. So there might be bureaucratic delays, which means like the red tape of the foreign governments that is operating. And also there might be policy reversal if the government is further changed subsequently, that the promises may be broken. Using a local financing uh, would be another issue. So, for example, yes, you uh, take on additional debts in a local currency. There might be currency fluctuation and also the interest rate fluctuation as well. And also, you may be having joint ownership, okay, with the foreign countries' investors, you may be caring about loss of control and then the cultural mismatch. So make sure they're ready. Now, specifically in your syllabus, you are required to talk about the foreign currency risk as well as the interest rate risk. So why this will be a case is because in terms of the foreign currency risk, you are afraid that your subsidiary has got assets, liabilities, equity, income, as well as the expenses. 
when you are preparing for the financial statement for the entire group, you will need to retranslate all these elements I just mentioned, like the asset, expenses, income, and so on, into the group using the group's currency. And therefore, there would be fluctuations in value okay, related to each of the elements in turn. Now, the best way to manage the translation risk is by to match the asset with liabilities and to match income with expenses. The reason why this will be a case is because, the, for example, you're having a foreign subsidiary. So, for example, initially you've got the income worth of 100 expenses. For example, you pay debt and you pay the uh, interest costs, let's say $30. Now, because of the exchange rate fluctuates, that the income may be reduced to only 80. Now, if that's the case, that initially, if the first circumstance that the exchange rate did not fluctuate, you've got a profit worth of 70 that. If the forex rate actually fluctuates, if you are taking the debt on a constant basis, of course your profit will be lowered. However, if you're going to be increasing your expenses up, so this means that because of the uh, forex rate changes, it will decrease the income as well as the expenses at the same time, and then you will maintain the same level of profit in the end. So this is why to match the foreign income with the foreign expenses, so for example, to borrow at local currency, will be one of the ways that we can hedge against the translation risk. However, if the forex rate continues to be weakened, so if you're receiving the foreign currency as your income, of course, it will impair uh, okay, on a constant basis. So in this particular case, if you're facing economic risk, okay, because of the country economy is not good, one of the main, for example, terrorist attacks or uh, stock market crash, or uh, you simply say that, for example, like Russia, okay, so uh, invading into Ukraine, or perhaps because of the failure of the exchange rate system in the longer term, if you're facing one of these economic risk to hedge against that, you will use the words diversify. So in other words, instead of putting all of your eggs into one basket, why not to diversify or to expand your supply chain, to work with other suppliers in other market, or to diversify your business operations? Having operations in more foreign countries that will certainly help. And of course, you can also think about to change your prices in order to uh, compensate for the losses that you make because of the uh, forex rate changes. Now, the final risk related to a foreign currency is the transaction risk, which means the one-off transaction. So, in other words, you are dealing with the foreign customer or the foreign supplier. You need to receive that money from a foreign customer or you need to pay money to a foreign supplier. You are afraid that the forex rate may change. Now, the ways you're going to be hedging against the transaction risk will either be not using the financial instrument, which means the internal technique, or using the financial instrument like the external hedging technique. So, for example, you can invoice in your home currency, which means like Simba is receiving the UK pounds, irrespective of where you pay. Alternatively, you can receive the money in advance, which means leading, or receive the money later, lagging. It will be depending on whether or not the exchange rate would fluctuate. And then, you're going to be matching the income as well as the expenses altogether, like what we said before in the translation risk. Alternatively, you can use netting approach. So in other words, within our group, instead of subsidiaries, transferring money to one to another, suffering lots and lots of transaction risk or the forex risk, why not just to net them off and to see the final outcome, 
of one company within the group to how much it's going to pay the net amount to other companies within the same group to reduce the number of transactions, to reduce the currency risk exposure, in other words. However, if you're using the external technique, for example, you may be considering the forward market hedge. Forward market hedge would simply mean that you are entering into a contract with the bank and you fix the foreign exchange rate for the future one into today. And you need to exercise that. However, in some of the market, it's absolutely not allowed from a government's point of view, to be, to be honest, it's quite ridiculous, uh, to buy or sell the foreign currencies. And this is why you may be using the saves, okay, which means the synthetic foreign exchange agreement. Okay, it's like it's like a futures, uh, tailored futures agreement. So you can uh, buy or sell the currency uh, at some point in the future. Alternatively, you can use the differences in terms of the interest rate between your home country and the foreign country in terms of the borrowing rate and the deposit rate, and use that differences and to conduct uh, the hedging for the forex, which means the money market hedge. Alternatively, you can enter into a currency futures contract. So in other words, the currency futures contract is like to buy or sell the foreign currency at some point in the future, but through the standardized market. But you have to exercise it. But if you want to have an option of not to exercise it, it's like the currency option, but you have to pay the premium fees for that. But if you're thinking about the currency swap, on the other hand, especially for the international investment, they input your money into a foreign country and you expect to get the money out, for example, in three years' time or five years' time, at the agreed forex rate to be agreed today. So this is called the currency swap. And of course, it's only for the long term. Uh, forex hedge. Now, another area in your syllabus is how to manage the interest rate risk. Now, why do we care about the interest rate risk? So actually, that we are caring about the gap exposure. Now, what do I mean by that is that if you've got the interest income, because you are buying the securities and something like that and you get the interest and to minus the interest cost or interest expense if there will be more interest income than the interest expense I would say that this will be positive which means net deposit so this means that if interest rate actually rises you will have a gain if it falls you will have a loss because the if the interest rate actually falls, so this means that interest income will fall, interest expense will also fall, because interest income is more than interest expense, uh, of course we end up with a loss there. So the idea behind it is that whether or not you should be keeping a positive gap or negative gap for that. And of course, this method would usually be used by bank and also other financial institutions. Of course, a uh, safe whale company may be considering that as well, but less likely for that. Because for banks, they may be managing the positive gap if they believe that the interest rate will soon rise in the future. And of course, they will have a gain for that. So this will be a strategy to manage the interest rate in such a way. Another way to manage the interest rate risk will be to consider the basis risk. Because you may be buying, for example, the government security. You may be seeing that there will be different uh, maturity dates. For example, some will be uh, for seven days and some will be for 180 days and some even for 360. So if that's the case then, for the government securities that you're buying, it's your asset because you've bought it. However, 
if you're taking on additional debt, you need to pay interest. If these two items, the length will be quite different. So for example, the government securities for three months, however, the debt is for five months. The interest rate fluctuations will not be uh, the same for these two items altogether. It will create a difference between these two, and we call this as the basis risk. Now, the ways they're going to be managing this would be to match the asset duration with the liability duration. So making sure that the interest rate fluctuation for this period would be nearly the same. Okay, so and that would be another way. But the common ways that we can manage the interest rate risk will be first things to focusing on the floating interest rate in instrument. What do I mean by instrument? It's like the contract, it's like the financial instrument. Now, floating interest rate, which means the interest rate will keep changing all the time per the market rate. So, you may be buying the securities and receiving the interest income, or perhaps you're taking on the floating interest rate debt and you need to pay the uh, changing interest rate on that. So this means that we need to focus on the changing interest rate, which means the cash flows risks. So making sure that you are happy with that. Fixed interest rate instruments, on the other hand, is where you're caring about the market value risk. Because the fixed rate instrument is like you're paying the fixed interest rate, so which means irrespective of the market rate changes subsequently, you still pay the fixed rate. You don't need to care much about the changing interest rate from a market. But if that's the case then, if you're taking a loan, for example, paying let's say 7% of the fixed rate, but subsequently the the market interest rate falls to only 3%. We end up still paying for 7%, which means you're paying quite a lot. You're actually losing part of the value of your money because you shouldn't have paid that too much, but you fixed that rate already. So the real impact on the market value for that. Okay, so make sure they identify these type of risks. And therefore, the ways that we can hedge against the interest rate risk Firstly, matching, to match the uh, reference interest rate because of the basis risk. Smoothing, so for example, keep a balance of the fixed and floating rate debt. Okay? Alternatively, you can also consider the interest rate swap. So which means that if in your country it's relatively difficult for you to borrow at fixed rate, but you will need to borrow a fixed rate, for example, you can find a counterparty through the bank. And then the counterparty who is willing to borrow a floating rate will be exchanging that interest with you. Okay? So it borrows at fixed rate and you borrow at variable rate. And then you swap, you exchange that with the counterparty. So effectively, that you're borrowing at the counterparty's fixed rate. And the counterparty is borrowing at your variable rate, for example. And of course, the savings will be arranged through the bank and after charging a banking fee. And of course, the net amount will be shared across these two counterparties. So make sure that you've got to, to an idea of that. And of course, the biggest issue related to the swap is like, uh, if not arranged through the bank, you will be subject to default risk, okay, to a certain extent there. It's an OTC instrument, which means the tailor-made instrument offered by bank, for example. Before we move on to the core activity C, I'm going to be stopping the recording now for the core activity B, applying to the Safeway company. I hope you find this section useful. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye-bye. A, P, C, accounting for your future.